Okay, in the previous segment, we looked at discourse analysis from the point of view of resolving uh, anaphoric expressions. Now we're going to look at some other properties of discourse, specifically the concept of coherence. So coherence is an important property of discourse. And let me show you some examples that make it obvious. The first example is, I saw Mary in the street, period. She was looking for a bookstore. Uh, it should be pretty obvious that those two sentences fit well together. The second sentence explains a little bit about Mary and explains why I mentioned that I saw her in the street. So there's no problem here. The second example becomes a little bit problematic. I saw Mary in the street. She has a cat. Well, while both of those sentences are perhaps true, it is a little awkward to use them in the same paragraph because there's really no logical connection between the two unless perhaps there's more in the discourse that says she has a cat and then the cat likes to go outside and therefore Mary took the cat outside and that's why I saw her in the street. But overall, this looks a little awkward. What about the next example? I saw Mary in the street, period. The Pistons won. Well, now this is really a bad example of coherent discourse. There's really no connection between those two sentences. It's very hard to imagine a situation in which those two would make sense together. So as you can see, we can have a variable uh, degree of coherence in discourse. And better text, better written text is more coherent. So one of the theories that uh, is used in computational linguistics to understand how coherence works was introduced by uh, Mann and Thompson in the 80s. And that theory is called RST, or Rhetorical Structure Theory. It is used to determine the structure of discourse and identify uh, some relations that hold between sentences and fractions of sentences. So the RST relations are uh, determined by two uh, items. One is called the nucleus of the relation and one is called the satellite. Let me give you examples of both of those. Suppose that we have the two sentences. The carpenter was tired, period. He had been working all day. As you can see, the second sentence elaborates on the first one. It gives us an explanation why the carpenter was tired. One other thing that is important here is that it starts with a pronoun. So clearly that sentence, the second sentence, is less important than the first one because it depends on the first one for its existence. You cannot start with he. So in RST, the relation between those two sentences is determined as follows. We have a link between the two that says that he had been working all day is a satellite in the relation to the nucleus or the carpenter was tired. And as the names are probably uh, clearly indicating, uh, nucleus, the nucleus is more important than the satellite. So if we wanted to summarize this paragraph, we would probably want to pick the nucleus before we pick the satellite. So one of the definitions in RST is that the satellite increases the belief in the relation described in the nucleus. So some relations have only one nucleus, others have more than one, and others have one nucleus and one satellite. So some of the examples of uh, RST relations that I want to show you today are listed here. The first one is a result. So for example, the carpenter worked all day, period. The new cabinet was ready in the evening. So as you can see in this example, the second sentence shows the result of the action in the first sentence. Explanation. The carpenter was tired, period. He had spent the entire day building a new cabinet. So in this example, the second sentence explains why the fact in the first sentence is true. Third example, parallel. The carpenter worked all day, period. The upholster took the day off. So we have two sentences that have parallel structure, and the second one uh, is in parallel with the first one. Elaboration. The carpenter built a cabinet, period. The cabinet had four doors and an oversized rear panel. So the second sentence, as is pretty obvious here, gives additional information that explains in more detail, uh, elaborates on the information in the first sentence. And there are other relations in RST. I'm going to show you a list of them uh, separately. Uh, so some of them have a nucleus and a satellite. Those include a circumstance, volitional clause, purpose, interpretation, restatement, and summary. And others are multinuclear, or in other words, have more than one nucleus. Those are sequence, contrast, and joint. So here's a larger table with examples. Uh, I'm just going to mention a few of them in uh, more detail. So uh, let's start with the first one, antithesis. 
The nucleus of an antithesis relation is the ideas favored by the author, and the satellite is the ideas disfavored by the author. So, for example, the author may say, I like dogs, period, but I hate chihuahuas. So, in the second example, we have the satellite, something that is disfavored, and the first example is the nucleus, is the ideas favored by the author. Let's now look at an example of a discourse that has been analyzed using rhetorical structure theory. Uh, so the document comes uh, from uh, the Christian Science Monitor. It has a few sentences. The title is Bouquets in a Basket with Living Flowers. And then it goes on like this. There is a gardening revolution going on. People are planting flower baskets with living plants, mixing many types in one container for a full summer of floral beauty. To create your own Victorian bouquet of flowers, choose varying shapes, sizes, and forms besides a variety of complementary colors. And then new sentence, plants that grow tall should be surrounded by smaller ones and filled with others that tumble over the side of a hanging basket, period. Leaf textures and colors will also be important. And then finally, there is the silver white foliage of Dusty Miller, the feathery threads of lotus vine, floating down from above, the deep greens or chartreuse, even the widely varied foliage colors of the coleus. So this document was analyzed by Mann, Matheson, and Thompson in 1983 using RST. And this is the uh, representation that they came up with. So we have a total of nine, what they call utterances. So utterances are portions of sentences that have some separate semantics. Uh, not all of them correspond directly to sentences. However, a sentence can be split into multiple utterances. So we have uh, the, at the lowest level, eight and nine, utterances eight and nine are connected with each other using an elaboration RST relation. And if you remember from a few slides ago, the arrow points from the satellite to the nucleus. Okay, so once those two uh, utterances, eight and nine, are combined together, the next thing that we can do is to merge six and seven, and also six with eight and nine. Both seven and the group eight, nine, are satellites for uh, the nucleus that appears in six, and the relation here is elaboration. Now we have a chunk between six and nine that can be connected with five uh, using the purpose relationship. But in this case, the satellite is on the left, to create your own Victorian, quote unquote, bouquet of flowers, and the nucleus is six to nine. And then on the left hand side of the diagram, we have an elaboration relation between utterances three and four, where four is the satellite. Once we combine three and four together, they together as a group form the satellite of another elaboration relation with nucleus two. And then we can combine the group two four with the group two nine using background, with two four being the satellite. And then finally, we can have another relation at the top called preparation, which links the satellite utterance number one with the nucleus, which consists of everything else in the sentence. So this is an example of how uh, we can annotate texts for rhetorical structure relations. And uh, I'm going to tell you right now that there exist uh, automatic parsers that take uh, uh, narrative text of this nature and automatically label it with RST relationships in a hierarchical way. So one nice resource is at Simon Fraser University in Canada. Uh, that website has the largest repository of texts annotated for RST relations that can be used for training and also includes a lot of examples and uh, papers on this topic. So the process of identifying the discourse structure is called discourse parsing. I'm going to just give you one example of this. There has been a lot more work that you can find on the ACL uh, anthology website. So the paper that I want to discuss very briefly here is by Marco and Eshihabi from 2002. Uh, in that example, they looked at four RST relations, uh, contrast, uh, cause explanation evidence as a sequence, condition and elaboration, and they also had a null category that corresponds to non-relation. So they used up to four million automatically labeled examples per relation and used a very simple classifier based on naive base. And they used as features word co-occurrence features. Uh, to build uh, their discourse trees. So more details about this work can be found in the paper on the ACL Anthology website. So very briefly, I'm going to discuss one other influential paper uh, in the history of discourse analysis. This is work by uh, Gross, Seidner, and other people on centering. So centering is a theory 
that tells you out of all the possible candidates for an offer resolution, uh, which one is the so-called center or the most important concept, the most salient concept that is likely to be used in anaphoric expressions in future sentences. So the goal of centering is to understand the local coherence of discourse and to understand why some texts are considered more coherent than others. So one of the ideas in centering is that there will be more inference load, as in cognitive load, over the person uh, reading the text that would be associated if the referring expressions were chosen badly. So, for example, a pronoun that refers to a word several sentences back. Also, too much focus shift makes the text hard to understand. So, the idea of centering is that we're going to keep the, so, so, some sort of uh, theme of the document as we go along through the sentences, and this theme is going to change relatively uh, rarely. So uh, the centering example that I'm going to give you is based on the idea of backwards-looking centers and forward-looking centers. Every utterance, u sub n, is known to have a so-called backwards-looking center, cb, which connects the current utterance with the previous utterance, u n minus 1. Also, every utterance has a partially ordered set of forward-looking centers, C sub f, that are related to the next utterance, and their order depends on syntax. So, for example, the subject salience is of a, a candidate is higher than the one for the object. And finally, we're going to pick the preferred center among all the forward-looking centers based on its uh, highest salience score. So, for more details on this work, you can read the original papers by Gross and Seiner. And very quickly, I'm going to mention some additional work on cross-document structure. So this is discourse analysis across multiple related documents. So CST is based on relations similar to RST to some extent, but which apply across multiple sentences, multiple documents, and so on. So the examples are things like identity. That's when the same text appears in more than one document. So S here refers to sentence, P refers to paragraph, and D refers to document. Some of the other CST relationships include subsumption. So, for example, one of the sentences may include facts A and B, and the, the next sentence may include facts A, B, and C. So we say that the first sentence of those subsumes the second one, and so on. So there's two pages of relations that appear in CST. And there has been work on automatically identifying CST structure in document sets that contain related documents. So one thing that makes CST very different from RST, however, is that RST is a deliberate relation, whereas CST is typically not deliberate because the documents may be uh, from different sources and written by different people. So CST is more of a surface structure uh, relation, whereas RST is a measure of the uh, deliberate uh, coherence of the discourse as written by the human. So one more example of discourse analysis is something that was introduced by Simone Teufel and Mark Moons in the early 2000s. Uh, that is known as argumentative zoning. It is a discourse model for analyzing scientific papers. And in their work, which spans uh, several years, they have looked at the following uh, labels for different zones of the scientific documents. AIM is one of them. So for example, the AIM can be the research goal of the paper. Textual is the statements about sentence structure. For example, in the next section, we're going to talk about X, and we're going to conclude in section 7. Own is a description of the author's own work, for example, methodology, results, and discussion. Background is a generally accepted scientific background. For example, uh, the moon uh, rotates around the Earth. Contrast is comparison with other work. Basis is statements of agreement with other work. And then the final category is other, everything else. So, for example, the description of other researchers' work and so on. So, one other thing that I want to mention about discourse analysis is the idea of local entity coherence. So, this is work that was done uh, more recently by Regina Barzilai and Mirella Lapata. So, the idea here was uh, to look at the way that entities are introduced in documents and how uh, they are referred to uh, later on in that document. So let's look at an example from that paper. Uh, the first sentence says that the Justice Department, which is the subject of the sentence, is conducting an antitrust trial as the object against Microsoft Corporation. So Microsoft Corporation is neither the subject or the object of the sentence. 
with evidence, again, X means that it's not the subject or the object, that the company, so the company here is another subject, is increasingly attempting to crush competitors and competitors is an object. So the idea here is that we want to group together expressions that refer to the same entity. For example, Microsoft Corporation, Microsoft and the company would form one cluster. Netscape would form another cluster. The Justice Department would form a third cluster and so on. And then within each of those clusters, we want to see whether the first time that an entity is mentioned, it is described as a subject, and maybe perhaps later it's described as an object, and finally it is mostly described as something else, an X. So in the paper by Barzilai and uh, Lapata, they came up with this kind of entity grid, uh, which shows you uh, the number of sentences in the document, in this case six. And then in each of those sentences, which of the entities is mentioned and whether it is the subject, an object, or something else. And then they come up with a model that is similar to an HMM uh, that tells you what's the probability that some entity that will be uh, referred to first as a subject, then again as a subject, or first as a subject, then as an object, and so on. And you can see all the combinations of S, O, X, and, and not, nothing. So this is uh, one more example from the Barzilai and Lapata paper, and I want to tell you that the active, there's a lot of active research in discourse analysis in ACL that has been uh, uh, built on top of this previous work. So this concludes the section on uh, discourse analysis. We're going to switch next to dialogue systems.